Welcome to another episode of The, the Epic, Epic Family, Family Road, Road Trip. Trip. Hey guys, this week we're doing something a little different. We're doing a Q&A. Last week we asked you for your questions on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and you sent us a whole bunch. We didn't get to all of them, but we've got to a bunch of your questions. We hope you find it entertaining, informative, educational. We, we are going to put chapters in here so you can just uh, move around to the questions and the answers that you're looking for if you want, or you can just watch the entire video. Let's roll the first question. It's definitely a consideration. Everything costs more when uh, fuel goes up and fuel is one of our number one expenses. Fu food and fuel, the two things that are going up the most. But um, we, you just got to keep going. It's, if you can afford to keep going, you got to keep going. So that's kind of where we are. So just as fuel prices were starting to skyrocket, we were starting to head back here to the island. So that worked out great for us. We're off the road right now, but we can't stay off the road forever. So we're going to keep going but man let's hope the uh, fuel goes back to where it was in 2019. I mean technically you could but uh, it would tear up the ground so we're not going to. We ride mountain bikes here but it's a pristine ecosystem that we want to take care of and motorcycles, dirt bikes, any kind of motorized vehicle would do damage and uh, so we keep it to foot traffic and occasionally we'll ride a bike. Over the next year, we want to spend a little more time here at the island. Uh, in fact, one of our big projects is uh, prepping this place for spending the winter, which is, um, if we decide to do it, it's going to be a crazy adventure. It gets really cold and wintry and inhospitable up here, and you got to make sure you have lots of food supplies, lots of uh, firewood, and a way to keep yourself warm. So. Um, lots, lots to be done on that one, but that's our short-term project, along with some other trips that we were planning uh, five years from now. I hope we can still be doing what we're doing now. We're building a YouTube channel, but more than that, we're building a brand and uh, nice to speak on stages, and I hope to continue doing that when things get more back to normal. For two years, that whole industry was shut down because nobody was gathering. Things are coming back now, which is really good. I'm not in any hurry to get back at it because we're building this side of the platform, but they're really the same thing. You know, speaking on stage to a group of people or producing content that's informative, educational, um, and fun to watch, you know. So we're in, I'm enjoying what we're doing. I hope to be doing it five years from now. Ten years from now, if we are uh, fortunate enough to be around, we I hope to be healthy and strong and with Carol. I'm sure we'll be empty nesters full, full time at that point. Um, we'll be in-laws, if not grandparents. Really exciting times. We just look forward to each chapter of our life, but we take it one day at a time. Yeah, we plan on using some freeze-dried meals. We used them on a couple of our hikes. And uh, yeah, they're really nice and easy, simple. So definitely. Um, yeah, we are putting away uh, bulk food of our own and shrink wrapping it and all that. But uh, we also bought a good supply of pre-freeze dried foods that we can use for emergency situations or just for meals or take camping or hiking or whatever. So yeah, we definitely do that. I think um, on our list of things to get would be a freeze dryer because those things, uh, we've been doing some research and they look really convenient. And we know some people that do backpacking trips and long-term travel that freeze dry all their own food for the trip. So I think it would be a worthwhile investment. So they're not formally attending a certain college or university, but they are, they have the same uh, philosophy that I had growing up and we seem to have as a family, which is your life is a continual education. We do self-learning. Um, we attend courses online like crazy, things that we're interested in, things that help our careers, our jobs, our futures. Um, so education is never done. It's not like you go to a certain number of classes and then you're done learning. It's something that we hope to be a life, lifelong experience. And uh, when I was, you know, I, I think I developed a lot of those ideas from when I had a business and I would hire people for a certain job and you'd hire someone, for instance, that got a diploma in marketing but had no experience 
or you'd interview someone like that and then you'd interview the next candidate who had a huge portfolio but no formal education and often I would choose the person who had the portfolio the experience because real world experience is just as valuable if not more valuable than what you learn in a classroom so um, that's kind of our that's how, where we stand on that and uh, you know the kids we knew very early on they're extremely smart but they're more entrepreneurial than kind of scholastic where they're going to sit in the classroom so that's uh, our approach maybe a little unconventional approach to uh, education but it's been a great education so far and one that will go on hopefully forever. Yeah, when we're full-time empty nesters, we hope to do what we're doing now and do a combination of off-grid living and traveling. So we go on expeditions around the world, come back and spend some time off the grid here at the cabin. I mean, our really short-term plans, uh, the boys, the kids are uh, going to Europe with X Overland, the Nor Nordic countries. That's going to be an amazing trip for them. Carol and I are hoping to go from here all the way to the west coast and then straight up to the Arctic Circle actually to the Arctic Ocean in Tukti Aktuk. That's a long trip, but we're excited to embark on that. Probably, like, honestly, setting up your living quarters. Because in your house, you know, it's not like you have to fold out your house. It's just there, and you walk in, and you know it's dry and warm, where when you're camping every night, you have to set up your tent. That's where you kind of live, and you, you know, have fires to cook and to heat yourself. So, yeah, probably that. You know, I found the adjustment for me uh, quite easy. It was something I was looking forward to for so long that when it, when it happened, we just embraced it wholeheartedly. We didn't miss what we left behind. We looked forward to what was up ahead. So it wasn't difficult at all. Um, I went from being very busy in a business to being very busy in a new venture, which this was, and being busy as a father, which is what I was destined to be and what I enjoyed being the most. So. Um, wasn't difficult at all and the two are so similar living off the grid at a cabin or living off the grid on the road have a lot of similarities and those skills we built in the first year and have never looked back. Um, the, the funny thing is people ask us about camping in Ontario and not being our home is the place we've camped the least so when, when we have a place like this we don't see any need to go camping we just stay put here and we're surrounded by wilderness. But we have driven that route, the Trans Canada, from east to west many times, and that's a gorgeous area, north of Superior. That whole area is beautiful. Uh, there's some great uh, provincial parks that we've camped in there that are uh, definitely worth the visit. Get in north of Superior wherever you can. It's it's a spectacular area. Um, as far as you know, free camping and uh, logging roads and all that stuff, we haven't, believe it or not, explored that area much. So. We'll be looking for your comments on that. Yes, that is uh, one of my favorite places I've ever been to. And uh, I definitely want to go back on a motorcycle. Newfoundland, we, we went to years ago. and we, We've been wanting to go back ever since. Such, a, such an awesome place. Uh, we loved the people and the music and the culture and the landscape and the remoteness of it all. And we crossed into Labrador and did a little bit of that. So yes, it's definitely on the list. Uh, such a magical place, can't wait to get back. So for Ontario health coverage, if you leave the province for a certain amount of time, you're no longer covered. So you want to make sure you have private health insurance. We got ours through uh, Alliance, I believe it's called, and uh, we'll put the link below. But um, there's a lot of different options and we've actually had different ones for different trips. So make sure you um, shop around a little bit. Um, if you stay out of the country for a certain amount of time, then you'll be called, you'll have to get expatriate insurance, um, which they handle for you. It's a little bit more expensive, but it, uh, it's definitely worth having. And we also have coverage from a company called uh, Global Rescue, and that's something you want to definitely take a good look at. It's not health insurance per se, but it is, you know, the health insurance that you buy takes care of your wallet so if you run into expensive medical bills they'll help cover that um, global rescue takes care of you your body your family and gives you the confidence you know if you're up in the mountains and you get uh, unable to get out for some reason there's a snow avalanche in front and there's no way to go back they will be able to come and rescue you so um, they have a net worldwide network that really gives you confidence when you're traveling and over the next 
months, we're going to be sharing a lot more about that for you. Yeah, mail is uh, something that's taken us a while to get used to handling. But like you said, we've reduced all paper mail except for what you absolutely can't. So things like taxes are about, that's about all we get mail for these days. Uh, license renewals, um, they'll send, you know, or a, a MasterCard or a credit card renewal. When those expire, they only send to one address. So we talked to my, my brother years when we started off and said, can we, you know, rent a little section of uh, your property, for, you know, the, um, so that we can use your address for mail and call it, you know, suite one or something. And what that did is allowed all of our, any mail, what little mail we get to go to his place. He, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but he doesn't mind just sorting it off to the side. And, um, and then, you know, we'll have him bundle it up and ship it off to us once uh, every couple of months. So we've been a little behind on certain things, but you know, nowadays, uh, if, the, if you don't respond to the mail, people will reach out some other way. So we've never had any problem. Um, and so we eventually get our, our mail. And, but the most important thing is try to reduce that down to the bare, bare minimum. Yeah, so Vandy's been an amazing vehicle for us and has done such a great job. But yes, you're right, it's, uh, the vehicle's getting old. And at, at this point, you know, things start to break on a fairly regular basis. We, we recently broke down on the side of the freeway you saw down in Idaho. If you watched that video, if you haven't watched that video, you got to check it out. Chuck came along and saved the day for us. Thank you, Chuck. But um, that could have happened way in the backcountry. So it got us really thinking, you know, uh it, about at some point retiring vandy um, not quite there yet so she's still got some uh some miles to go but uh it's definitely a consideration at some point a vehicle will get you know to the point where the maintenance and repair costs are uh, prohibitive so uh, before that happens we're gonna probably retire vandy to uh probably to the island area here so that we have a runaround vehicle that will give us more flexibility to, you know, maybe leave um, other vehicles in other places, fly in, and we know we have a vehicle here. So those are considerations. It would be very light usage at that point. Yeah, the Jeeps can get pretty heavy pretty fast because, uh, you know, buying overlanding equipment is kind of addictive, and there's always something new that we're picking up, and it, it can get pretty cluttered. But recently we've been going through, you know, and... Um, deciding what's necessary and what's not, getting rid of as much stuff as we can, because weight's definitely a, a big issue and something that needs to be addressed when you're overlanding. But actually, JXLs, the uh, Jeep Safari things we put on the back of the Jeep, I think that loaded uh, less than the load, but like 160 pounds or 60 pounds, 200 pounds. Yeah, 200 pounds. So that was a big deal and I mean, yeah. There's always lighter options. You just have to s decide what's worth it for you and what's not. Yeah, that's a continual uh, issue because you always have more and more gear to go into it. What we did was uh, we ran with the two Jeeps as long as we could and then we got a trailer and then a lot of the heavy stuff was offloaded into the adventure trailer. Um, so you can have some kind of chaser going behind you that can take a lot of the weight. Just the gear alone is heavy enough. You, if you have a fridge in the back and a stove, you have a rooftop tent up there, <clears throat> a roof rack, etc., etc., plus a, a bunch of people and a dog, it, it really adds up. So it's always a consideration. We're always probably a little heavier than we should be, but a uh, trailer has been the, the best option for us. And then we try to travel with as you know the lightest gear possible. When we switched to the uh, JXLs, we actually lost 200 pounds on each vehicle compared to the rooftop tents, the roof racks, and all that extra gear. We also have really good suspension, and I know there's another question about suspension. Um, that's one of the first things we did because we knew we were gonna be uh, loading up on gear, so we upgraded the suspension. I, I think my personal favorite one would uh, be a motorcycle trip on the Pan America. Um, that's one we've been talking a lot of, and uh, Newfoundland on motorcycles as well. That's some place we went to a, a while back, I believe it was in 2016. And uh, I've just been talking about going back ever since. And I think a motorcycle would uh, give it a lot better experience of the place. So yeah, those two. Um, so we're still having those discussions as a family, but Europe is definitely on the list. My uh, parents were both born in the Netherlands and 
Um, that's been on our list for a long time. The kids are doing the north uh, countries and we'll retrace their steps. Uh, the kids have been talking about places like UK and Ireland and um, man, all, you know, uh, all through Western Europe and the Baltics. There's really no end to where we want to go, but I think the Europe region will be uh, coming up. But um, that being said, we also want to do the Pan American, which will take us down into South America. We have been talking for a long time about South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, that whole area of the southern part of Africa and maybe up the east side or something. Um, how much planning? We, uh, we don't spend tons and tons of time planning. We, we know what our gear is. We're comfortable with that. We know what our vehicles can do. It's just a matter of uh, calling up a shipping company and getting on the road. I'm super excited. So as you guys all know that the kids are going and doing their Europe trip, and Pete and I are going to do our dream, one of our dream trips, and that is going up to Taktiaktuk. I think he mentioned it to me um, as a wild thought, um, uh, as a wild idea to do back when we had just met. So yes, 24 years later, him and I are gonna go and head out on this great adventure, and I'm just so excited. Well, recently we've been doing a lot of things, which uh, you can see on the videos, like splitting tons and tons of wood because when we're overwintering here, it's obviously really cold up in Canada. So we're gonna be needing our wood stove going almost constantly to keep the heat in the cabin going. So we've just been stacking piles of that. And then we do have propane heaters, so we'll be getting more of those 100 pound propane tanks just to kind of, you know, supplement the heat in the house. And that's what runs our stoves, like our cooking stoves. And then we've been preparing with freeze-dried meals and we've been ca canning a lot of our own food and uh, like lock tighting it. So we should be pretty good. Uh, we have some other plans on like, you know, finishing all these cooler cabins and fixing up other ones. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but um, it's all fun. So we're planning to overwinter here at the cabin, which is going to be a really fun challenge. Um, just learning how to deal with the cold, the ice, um, the thaw, and you know how to store the food, how to deal with water situations. Um, we did buy a composting toilet just in case. Uh, we don't have uh, running water, so that's gonna be interesting. And then keeping up with laundry and showers. So we're trying to problem solve right now here in the summer and fall with those situations. So we're really looking forward to that adventure and this might be the year that we do it. We don't know 100% yet, but in, in either case, we're preparing the cabin to may, be a place where we could always come back to. And we just see that as a necessity. We've seen border closures and things like that over the last couple of years. And it became evident to us that we need this place to be a place that we can run to at any time and it's ready to go no matter what the weather so that's what we're working on whether we stay up here this winter or not but the preparations are uh, whatever you can think of i mean we have to get a full improve the solar capacity and the battery capacity so that we can run everything up here without relying on, on fuel too much um, we have to prepare tons of firewood we have to bring in tons of uh, propane and have it stored away. We have to insulate the old cabin floor. The new section that we built is fully insulated, but the, the cabin itself, the walls, logs are a good insulator, but we insulated when we put the new roof on, we just have to do the floor this year. And then we, we are planning on building a, a little shed, a fairly decent sized shed that we can keep heated or partially heated to store our propane and batteries. And then the last thing I think would be uh, tons of food storage, which we've been working on now for some time and have different cold cellars and spread them out in different uh, stashes uh, here at the island. So uh, tons to do, but it's fun work and we're excited. And uh, you'll see in videos how we progress. I mean, all the states are beautiful. It's hard to pick one, but uh... I guess if I were to live there, I'd probably pick Montana, just because it's it's fairly similar um, weather and stuff to where we live now. It's a beauty place. It's impossible to um, pick a favorite, but if we had to pick a favorite part of the country, we'd kind of, you know, westward because in the west there's so much free camping, so much uh, Bureau of Land Management public land that you can just camp anywhere, and it's just so unique. But we could never settle on do we want to live by the ocean do we want to live in the mountains do we want to live near the desert do we want to live in the great plains 
in the forests. Uh, the beauty of overland travel is you get to experience all these places whenever you want so that we, we would have a hard time settling down in one of them. But um, if we had to live in one state, and or at least buy a property in one state, we'd probably pick Arizona or Florida. The, the reason is for being up here in the summer, the weather's perfect here in the summer, and then you want to usually escape to somewhere warm. warm. So parts of Florida, some remote island somewhere would be great. If not there, Arizona's awesome in the winter, such perfect temperature all, all winter long. Oh, that's a toughie, as uh, each state um, is so beautiful, and the more we explore a state, the more we fall in love with it, and we see how much more there is to explore. Um, man, I, I love Utah, Arizona, Montana, Oregon special, just, I mean, my, my family's there, and I love the coast, but yeah, I can't put a finger on one yet, so that time hasn't come yet. All right, so we've had three types of tent, the, the fold over one, we've had the clamshell, and now we have the JXL, which is uh, uh, a whole camping system where you're actually sleeping in the Jeep. Um, and all of them we've loved for that part of our journey and for that uh, time in our, our travels. So the, the fold over tent was great for that part of our journey. And we always had the kids to jump up there and help us pack it all together. And being that it folded over, it left the front of our roof rack empty for storage, which was great. Then when the kids went off uh, working with, uh, on their internship with uh, XO last year, Carol and I found ourselves alone and we thought, you know, it's too hard to pack up with just the two of us. It's not impossible, but we were looking for a quicker solution. And we had one of the clamshells, and, or two of those, and those were great. Very easy to deploy, very easy to put away. Um, so it really depends on your uh, situation, but we did lose all the rack space on the front of the rack because they're long, much more, much longer. Um, and then now we have the JXLs, which we've only had for a short time and we're going to be going on some expeditions with them, but, um, they give us the opportunity to stay inside. So if you're going out for a weekend or a week or a month, you know, the true rooftop tent, is perfect for you and we've spent many many years like that but the more we got into rough weather and uh, you know couldn't travel chase the sun like we used to or chase summer like we used to because of border situations and all that we started to realize we need the ability to camp inside if we're doing this full time and so with the JXLs we can wake up in the morning and make a coffee without ever going outside so that's a consideration for long-term full-time travelers. I mean, the Jeeps, especially the blue one, Vandy, kind of does feel like family. It's been with us for such a long time on lots of amazing adventures. So definitely feel, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to get rid of it. it. At some point, it obviously will need to be replaced as far as what that vehicle would be. Um, you know, I love Jeeps. Jeeps are awesome. Uh, recently, you know, with our recent experiences with X Overland, I kind of fell in love with the Tacomas as well and the Tundras. But... Uh, I don't know, I kind of like the motorcycle idea, but yeah, we'll see when that time comes. I mean, we're always open to replacing or changing our, our vehicles. Right now, the Jeeps are doing a great job. I don't think we'd ever sell Vandy. Uh, too much history there. It's something we'd uh, pass down to the, within, or keep within the family somehow, and or just retire here, like I was talking about earlier. Um, but yeah, uh, your needs change over the years and and you, your vehicle of course will need to change with that so we're always open to those ideas we're always looking we're always keeping our eyes open meeting other people seeing what their rigs are doing and there is no perfect rig out there there's um you'll you'll take care of one need and you'll lose on the other so you know we love those big trucks but um for the way we like to travel now and the places we like to go there'd be some limitations as to where you could go but at some point a bigger truck might make sense. So that's kind of where we are right now. With the Jeeps and the JXL conversions that allowed us to kind of keep doing what we're doing. The Jeeps are very capable with the, the campers on. It doesn't affect their capability. So we could go up into the mountains and not worry about you know where we go. And yet we can have that interior camping uh, comfort. Well, that's a great question. Be, when we're doing intercontinental travel, we're going from coast to coast uh, of a continent or crossing several countries, things like that, you probably are doing about at least 70% pavement, 30% off-road. 
um, you're usually traveling pavement to get to a certain area and then you're going into the mountains for instance. So um, our trip to Tuktoyaktuk for instance, we're gonna be taking the Trans Canada almost across the country. So that's a lot of pavement and then it's paved heading north up to Yukon and it's paved within Yukon, but then you hit the Dempster and you start getting into gravel and then dirt. So um, that trip is probably uh, typical of long distance travel where it's probably 70% paved 30% off-road. Um, if you take what we did this summer, last year, we crossed all of Colorado from Wyoming to the Four Corners, almost all, that was like 98% off-road and a tiny amount of pavement. And the reason was we were following a, a back route, a backcountry discovery route, which is designed to take you across the state uh, on a backcountry trail. Yeah, I think it's always nice to have a place you can kind of come back to and, uh, you know, kind of reset everything and get ready for your next adventure. The island's always been like that for us, even before we were traveling. It was a nice place to come up, relax. But now it's uh, kind of our, you know, our travel hub, I guess. Before we go on all our trips, this is where we do most of the planning. Uh, and, you know, if we're relaxing, I mean, even though it's 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 quite a lot of work maintaining old cabins like this, but fun work so I just got distracted from the question but anyways yeah it's it's nice to have a spot to kind of set down reset before heading out on your next adventure to have a place to come back to every once in a while yeah I think it's nice um, it's kind of special because around our whole cabin um, every time we go out on a trip <laughs> it's kind of funny our Jeeps get so heavy with rocks that we collect on different uh, trails or hikes that we do. I, there's so many rocks around the cabin. I think it has made it all the way around the cabin now of, um, yeah, just different memories. And so like that kind of is really special because as the kids get older and maybe when they get married and they bring their kids up here, they can show them the rocks or show them different memories that they had. And then hopefully they do the same with their children. Um, yeah. I mean, at this point in our travels, after seven years on the road, we, we, think it's very important to have a place to come kind of come home to kind of a home base where you can put your feet down you don't need anything fancy you don't need anything big but it's just you, you do get road weary after a while um, and especially with small kind of camping the way we are small vehicle camping um, you don't really have a place to stretch out and have as home we know people that have been on the road for a lot for very long extended periods of time and they don't have that same feeling it's because they're in a much bigger vehicle and so it feels, it gives you that feeling of home, I guess. But uh, so the way we're camping, rooftop tenting and, and so on, uh, it's just great to have a place to kind of stretch your legs and, and get off the road for a bit. Um, no, I don't think it was difficult. In fact, it's, uh, it's probably easier because you can actually raise your kids. You have the time to do that. You don't have all the distractions. Um, you know, whoever your kids are spending the most time with, it's those folks that are actually raising your kids, unfortunately. So sometimes that's their friends. If they spend all their time with their friends, the biggest influence on their life is gonna be their friends. Or if it's a teacher or uh, some kind of a youth leader or something like that. As parents, if you wanna raise your kids, you really have to do that job and you need time to do that job. So this lifestyle lends itself to giving you the time to be able to do your job. And it's, uh, it's just a blessing. And I wish every parent on earth could have that much time and um, many decisions can be made to give you more time to to do that job and uh, yeah so we're we're just super thankful for the opportunity it requires a lot of communication and so you have the time to do that all of those sound fun I, I really want to do more in Canada the funny thing is some of the most beautiful trails can be right outside your doorstep but you never really notice because you always feel like you have to go somewhere far away for it to be an adventure, but I would love to explore some of these. Uh, hopefully when we bring our motorcycles in at some point, we can do that. Um, yeah, we, we can't wait to continue exploring Canada. One of our favorite trips was up to a place called Pickle Lake and uh, the end of the road, it's as far north as you can drive in Ontario in the summer. And, uh, but on our list was the James Bay Road, the Trans Tiaga, and they were all closed when we were here last. So hopefully they're all open now and we can start exploring. We want to get back to Newfoundland, Labrador. That is just one of our places, favorite places in Canada. 
And, uh, but our first trip is all the way to the Arctic Ocean in Tuktoyaktuk in Northwest Territories. And um, we may or may not jump into the Arctic Ocean. Stay tuned. So we left the trailer and the bikes in Montana. We knew we were doing a quick crossing of the country and we were gonna be mostly at the island. So uh, it didn't make sense for us to take them with us. Um, so I think a common set of values and a common purpose is what helps keep you united as a family, as a group of any kind really, but most importantly as a family. And so we started out with uh, a set of core values work hard, play hard, and care by leaving the people we meet and the places we visit better than we found them. And those are the basic core values, but of course we have all kinds of other principles that are important to us as a family. And we review them together from time to time and then make sure we hold each other uh, to those standards as a family. And so that's uh, very important, number one. And number two, communication, communication, communication. It's, uh, it's so important to be able to and to take the time to talk things through. Kids growing up have all kinds of questions and want to figure out their own uh, view of the world and so um, what a privilege to be able to uh, talk together as a family on a regular basis and so um, the other part I guess is we don't just travel uh, somewhere along the way we started uh, the, the YouTube which has kind of become a business become building a brand and so there's a work component to that where we can all stay focused on as well. And I, you know, I grew up in a family business, but I think what, uh, and we raised our kids from an early age in a family business, but uh, the way we kept that working when we had the other business and now with this one is that um, we went about it with the mindset that it's not just a family business, we are a business family. So you're in this business, you might as well become a business family. What's the difference? Well. One is something outside of what you do, that would be a family business. A business family, it becomes part of what you do, so you're not annoyed by what you have to do. It's, it's how you survive and how you live. So those are a couple of things that have helped us stay grounded. As far as an indoor toilet, yes, we have all the luxuries of home here at the cabin. There was already an existing septic, which worked fine, but we added onto it when we did our addition. We don't know if it'll work in the winter fully. Um, we're hoping it will, but if not, we've got a backup, which is a composting toilet. You know, I haven't tracked that really carefully, but uh, man, it could be, depending on where we're going and where we are, you know, $20,000 would be a, a, a low, low estimate on fuel. That's one of our big expenses. So I'd probably, we're probably closer to 30,000 because we travel a lot of miles and we cover a lot of ground. But uh, to figure it out, you just have to figure out how much you plan on traveling per day and what your vehicle takes. Our fuel expenses went up when we went to two Jeeps, but um, that's just the way it is. So you use less off-roading, at least we find that crawling our way through trails than you do on highway driving, beating down the highway with headwinds and all that. So hopefully uh, that answers your question. All right, so when we chose this lifestyle, we also chose to prioritize family life over friend life. And um, even though having friends is important and everything, you, can, you have to balance your time. You can only spend so much time with one way or the other. And uh, for us, spending time together, adventuring around the world as a family was what we chose versus hanging out at the mall with our friends. In terms of uh, dating, we get that question a lot. The kids also chose, and it's been our, our family uh, way of doing things is to really just go through each chapter of life and enjoy that chapter. You're going to be uh, in a relationship and married for a good portion of your life and uh, hopefully until you're very, very old. Um, Carol and I have been married for 24 years. My parents for, what, 50 something. Um, and it's a wonderful chapter of your life, but being a kid, you only get that chance once. So uh, we just decided to focus on being a kid, do kid stuff, enjoy adventuring, enjoy having fun, and, and worry about the marriage and the dating and the, the, that kind of stuff later in life and you'll, you'll probably enjoy it better. And they see that talking to sometimes going back and you know, seeing friends from school and so on. And so many of them focused on the other way. And since they were very young, they've been worried about uh, dating and relationships and all that. And so many of them have, have regrets and broken hearts and all kinds of things that uh, they wish they hadn't have done. So uh, we, have, we have no regrets with the lifestyle we chose. And um, we have no doubts that the kids are going to find awesome life partners and, uh, and be very, very happy in their marriages. 
So yes, we're having fun. We absolutely look forward to every single day. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's such a unique lifestyle. Every day is different. It's it's you know it's really hard to um, get tired of something that's constantly changing. Retired? We hope to never retire because I don't think that's healthy. But um, when we get older and our kids are we're grandparents and so on then yes those two chairs we hope them to be here at the island and uh, sitting around reading a great book between adventures as we uh, hobble around on our uh, with our cane yes india sounds like a very interesting place to visit we love the culture and the food especially the food and we have so many subscribers from india that say hi to us on a regular basis so yeah definitely on the list yeah they're great uh just being able to live inside the jeeps has kind of been a game changer for us having that option to go inside if it's raining or really cold out is awesome you know whenever we recommend stuff we always like to put them through the test just by using them in our day-to-day -day life and we have but uh, i look forward to taking them on more trips and really uh, testing them out a bit more uh, so far so good we've we uh, haven't used them that much because we got them put on. We did some camping on the way out east here and then they've been uh, sitting at the marina for a little while. But we're about to embark on a big trip up to the Arctic in uh, Worsley. So we'll have more to report on that. But so far, so good. We love when we were in North Dakota and we woke up on a sleety, cold morning and we were able to make coffee inside and, and get dressed inside in the comfort of the uh, interior of the Jeep with the Wabasso heaters cranked. That's been amazing. Uh, we haven't been to high elevation yet, but uh, we'll keep you up to, up to date on that as we go. Uh, no, you never get tired of adventure. That's what life is all about. Life is an adventure, but uh, there are times you might get road weary like we were talking about before. So that's why the island is so great for us to put our feet down. I think the only time uh, that we would ever really get adventure burnout or like travel burnout is if your plans are too planned like if you have a too tight of a schedule it's pretty easy for me at least to get burned out because you know everything's scripted and you're just kind of going along with it where our, our mode of travel where we you know each day is kind of a surprise and we kind of just go with the flow uh it's a lot harder for that to happen at least for me i don't think the content creation takes away from it at all if anything it kind of enhances the experience for me we we're going to document our trip anyway we want it for our own memories anyway so it doesn't take away from our trip at all in fact it's become a really fun uh educational thing for us we're learning things we never knew we'd be interested in like cameras and apertures and uh focus and sound and all this awesome stuff it's so much fun so for us it doesn't take away from the adventure in fact it enhances it uh, yes, we love Alaska. We've explored a bit of it uh, about five years ago, and we definitely want to see more of it, especially with the Jeeps the way they are now. We can get much more off-road, and uh, so there's a lot more of Alaska we want to explore. So on your first trip, your first time way off the grid um, in your Jeep, you're going to have the jitters. That's, that's normal. But if we knew then what we know now, you know, a lot of those fears were created in our mind. We probably would have had a better night's sleep rather than spending all night listening for every single sound. So prepare, have the gear, have the, the, the important stuff, safety stuff, communication devices so that you feel that level of comfort and then have a good night's sleep. So that's a great question. Um, it's, it's a competency that you build over time. At first, you don't know what makes up a good camp, but after a while, you begin to say, hey, I look for certain things. If I'm in the desert, I wanna camp behind a bit of a shelter or have a source of water. Um, we love camping by rivers. We look for remote places where there's nobody else. Um, and then there's just certain things that give us a certain level of comfort and you'll build that intuition over time. If you like the place, you feel comfortable, you like the area, you just, uh, start, just start camping in places and you'll soon know what a perfect camp spot is for you. One of the tools we use is called iOverlander and there's a bunch of apps you can use um, between Gaia GPS which helps us find the trails to iOverlander which tells us places that others have been and they write a report about the place and that's very helpful especially for beginners. Uh, a dog sled would be awesome. We're totally going to try that with Lando. Uh, we talked about snowmobiles. It's something we've 
you know, we've obviously ridden quite a bit. They're awesome machines and probably the best option for, you know, snow travel, obviously. But uh, we have talked about getting those, um, like whatever they call the sled bike conversions for a motorcycle, um, where you can put on like the tracks and drive around like that, which uh, Peter really likes that idea. I'm still a bit skeptical on how that would work, especially if we were taking like loads of groceries and stuff. I have no idea what a snowcat is, but it sounds big and cool. So I'll have to look into that. But yeah, snowmobile is definitely an option. I think Lando's formed a uh, pretty close bond with our mom. Like he definitely gets more excited to see mom when she comes back from the grocery store, stuff like that. He just loves being around her. But um, I think he can kind of sense, you know, the alpha male tones in my voice and stuff. So he obeys me a lot more. He uh, senses my superior strength, looks and intellect. So I think I'm his master, but he likes mom the most. No, but uh, I, I think mom's definitely his favorite, uh, with a close second to me. Lando is a mama's boy, but uh, I think the whole family thinks each of them is Lando's favorite, so I don't know. You have to ask Lando that one. Yes, we have, and it's, it's been kind of difficult doing that because a lot of the time when we're cooking um, out on the road, I'll only be using like what I have available, and so the recipes constantly kind of changing and shifting to what ingredients I do have but we have kind of made mental notes and I've tried to write in the journal of like what our family um, favorites are and so we are definitely working on that. I don't think our cooking style changed you know since we got to the island. Um, it's basically exactly the same um, because that's why I like to use Dutch ovens and, and cast iron is you have a little oven on top of your stove top in the back of the Jeep or over the campfire and it's either inside the cabin with a conventional like you know propane oven that you just turn on. Um, it's a little bit more simpler because you have you know hot water running to do dishes and, and stuff like that where out on the road you would have to boil the water and, and do it that way. So if you have watched our videos and seen me in our videos, you can probably tell I have quite long hair. And that is something that I did struggle with a little bit was water conservation with my long hair because you do need a lot more water than other people to wash all of my hair. Um, but first thing is dry shampoo is a lifesaver, especially on the road and traveling. So that's a number one tip is dry shampoo because then obviously you also don't need to use any water for that. And then something that worked for me was keeping my hair in braids a lot. Just any types of braids kept my hair not only out of my face, but also just seemed to keep it cleaner, especially when it was hot out or when we we're in the desert and places like that. Something that helped me a lot was keeping my hair in braids. Like any sort of braids, it seemed to keep my hair out of my face but also keep my hair cleaner for longer, especially when it was hot or in the desert, and especially was nice when we were active and outdoors and doing things outside. So braids are a good tip, especially for long hair. And then for showering in general, I would always wash my hair at least every couple, like two to three days or every other night just with water. But um, for proper shampooing, I would just, soak my hair with water, then turn off the water to conserve it, and then thoroughly shampoo and condition my hair with the water off the whole time. And it's good to spend some time kind of thoroughly scrubbing and shampooing, and then I would quickly rinse it all out. And then my hair was good to go for another couple of days, um, especially if, if we weren't in a hot or humid place. Um, but yeah. So for video editing, software we use final cut pro we've been using it for just a little over a year now and we've been loving it and i would highly recommend it for anyone else especially people getting started and getting wanting to graduate to a little more advanced editing softwares because it's not too complicated to figure out and it's been working great for us I do journal quite often. I was especially more consistent basically every single day journaling, especially through 2016 to 2018 when we were in New Zealand, Australia, and Bali, Indonesia. I wanted to document that thoroughly and then continue documenting all of our other journeys throughout North America. 
and I love writing. I've always loved writing and it's always been a dream and a goal of mine to write a book one day and I've been so kindly encouraged by so many of you to do so. So I think it's just a matter of getting started and so we'll see where that goes and when that happens but I would love to do that in the near future so stay tuned for that. So as far as literature and classes for photography and videography, I will link all of the ones that I've used in the past and that I'm currently using to learn more skills and grow in my skills in the description box below so that you guys can check them out and I hope they're helpful for you. Um, because there are so many great resources out there that you can utilize to just learn and grow in so many different areas and also in more specific areas if you want to focus on just different aspects of photography or videography. There are different classes that are specific to those areas, which is really cool. So something I'd say is that it's definitely not just about the camera or the gear that you use. It's more about your eye in capturing the details and the beauty and the story and different things from your perspective, which is the fun in photography and videography and makes it so uniquely your own thing. You definitely don't want to just watch a bunch of videos from other people and then get stuck or hooked on something in the way that they do it because that's not necessarily the right way to do it because the beauty of photography and videography is there is no right way necessarily. There are great ways to capture more crisp or sharp images or get better lighting but that's more to do with settings and not necessarily in how to get it right in the way that you capture it beautifully and that's just about capturing it from your perspective so that's always a great way to go about it because I have definitely gotten in the rut of watching other people's content and getting too stuck in what was the trending way of capturing or creating videos and then you start to see that kind of translating into your work and then it just doesn't feel like your own. You just want to remember to stay uniquely yourself and just capture things the way that you see them. Some tips that I learned from more skilled people in photography and the videography space growing up and getting into this space were things like remembering to make sure your horizon angle is level. That made such a huge difference in my photos. I never even noticed in the beginning if my horizons were off but that is a that was a very helpful tip earlier on and learning and playing with and practicing with your symmetry. Symmetry and scale of objects and things in your photos is a really cool way to play around with different photography styles and especially out in nature when you have mountains and trees and all these big amazing things to capture. It's super fun to play with that and make and try different things. So especially if you're going to be doing your photography and videography mainly outdoors and in nature, Ang playing with your angles and scale and symmetry is really fun to do because you have mountains and cliffs and rock formations and trees and so you can use all of those things basically to practice those things and see the difference that just take, snapping a photo kind of mindlessly just capturing a pretty view versus thoughtfully going through the process of lining things up and getting the symmetry right and the angle right and maybe centering an object and maybe making another object look smaller against a big backdrop like just playing with all of those different aspects of photography and the playground basically that nature is for that is really fun and just remembering to have fun with it that is the main thing well for backup insulin supply in the uh you know when the fan gets hit sort of scenario is what the question was and uh that's something that, you know, I think of quite often, like, you know, you always hope to be prepared and and ready to go, you know, whether that's wood supplies, food supplies, you know, the right clothing and equipment and gear to have at your place you're going to be living or staying at in that sort of situation. Those are normal considerations for normal people to have, your water supply, food supply, and other things, the basic survival needs. But then with type 1 diabetes especially, I mean, for all diabetics and really anyone with medicine, medical uh, conditions, but especially type 1s is what we're talking about here. You have to think of insulin supplies um, as a bare minimum. That's the bare necessity to be able to survive as a type 1. Your body needs insulin. So uh, something I noticed, I don't know if it's actually a thing, but I, I think when I was first diagnosed like six years ago, when I would look at insulin vials, um, they only had like, they'd say a six month shelf uh, a year if it's kept in a cold, dark place. But then now when I look at the vials, they say three years if they're kept in a, a cool, dark place. 
obviously undisturbed, so you didn't take any insulin from it at any point. So I don't know if that's actually changed or if I just read it wrong um, back in the day or if I'm just, you know, my memory was from when you actually start to use the insulin, you only have six months to use it or up to a year to use it if you keep it in a cool place. But three years, three to five years, I think was an extension from what I, I was used to before. So that kind of made me happy to see anyway, that you could get like uh, a good supply of insulin at a certain time that'll last you more than a year and or you could get a couple years worth three or to five years worth of insulin and store it somewhere and it'll stay good for that time because then you know if nothing happens in uh, a time like three years or five years and you've got this great supply of stuff and you're using it but if something does happen you have three to five years with a solid supply of insulin and definitely uh, I think equally as important as having a good supply of insulin and a good place to store it um, in any sort of uh, bad global situation. Another important consideration is how you're eating and living and uh, maintaining your body in that time. Because you don't want to just be, if, if say you normally need a lot of insulin to be able to get by um, in a day or over a month, you go through a vial pretty often, like a thousand units in a relatively short amount of time. That's where your biggest draw of insulin is going to be, which would kill even a good supply of insulin very fast because if I say buy a technical year's worth supply of vials from like my worst guess on how I'm eating and treating um, my blood glucose levels but I then manage it extremely efficiently and I keep my insulin uh, like how much insulin I'm intaking to a minimum that time that I have the amount of insulin is going to be extended drastically. So I think that's equally as important as having a good supply is being, you know, regulating your blood and being really on top of managing your type 1. And having both of those things is uh, definitely going to make you have quite a supply. Yeah, so that's actually a pretty complicated question. It's um, it over the last, uh, I was 14 when I was diagnosed, so I guess uh, six years of having type 1 already. Um, I've learned how to manage it on the road. I was diagnosed on the road. I was diagnosed in Yosemite Park, of all things, when we were traveling around uh, in the, or I think our first year or second year. And um, right away I learned how to live on the road because that's what we were doing with type 1. It was more cushy back then. We had the RV and all that, so we had a steady fridge to keep it in. And um, we still had a good location in Canada, at least for a few months of my diagnosis. Um, yeah, my initial baptism with type 1 was on the road and then learned to manage it on the road right away as well. So I think uh, it's not, it, yeah, the thing about me talking about it is that it's not that crazy. But I think uh, ways to keep it cool. Nowadays we use uh, National Luna fridges and the cool thing about them is they're the same type of fridge that you keep in a Jeep or truck. The, they're smaller fridges. But the beauty of National Luna is they're the only fridge um, in that space that is actually certified to carry medicine. It's, it's what they would carry medicine around in, in places like Africa and other places doing mission trips and things where they bring medications to places that don't normally have it in hot places and it's it manages in insulin perfectly and it's kind of designed for that. So that's what we use to keep it cool in the Jeeps. On the bikes I use this Yeti, uh, I think it's called their Day Tripper. It's like this little Yeti lunch bag looking thing that uh, keeps it cool. Just put an icy thing in there and keep it separated from the uh, cool pack. And that's worked well on the bikes because it can keep for three, four days and often we're not out past that time. Traveling though on the road, you have a lot of risks um, of failures and other things. You're doing a lot of strenuous activities. I've had pods ripped off and other things. That's another question I'd answer is uh, I use a Omnipod pod. It lasts for three days and carry 200 units. Um, there's no tethers or wires or anything, which is just nice uh, for me. I, I didn't, never wanted that. Um, and then also it just the, the freedom of it. I don't even have to think about it besides using a PDM, uh, personal diabetes management system, just to Bluetooth control the pod itself. And then I use a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor by Dexcom. It's their G6, which uh, has been great. I know there's a G7 with the new Omnipods as a closed loop, loop system, which is what I'll be getting soon. But yeah, the G6 monitors my blood every five minutes. It gives a reading and can send it to a phone or smartwatch, whatever you have. 
So that's how I manage it is using those things. But yeah, like risks on the road are obviously increased. You're constantly active. So you have the chances of ripping something off or just breaking. But then also uh, another thing is keeping up with prescriptions and getting medication while you're traveling can be hard because you're changing your locations all the time. And really the uh, best way to get it right away is to go into a walk-in clinic if you're in the States or Canada and I'm sure in Europe. Um, you can go into a walk-in clinic. You just have to basically talk to a doctor, tell them you're type 1. They ask you all these health questions. And then they ask you what you need, and you just need a prescription for insulin or Lantus. Back then I needed long-acting insulin as well. And they give you whatever you need, and then you just pay whatever it costs. So in an emergency situation, that's your best bet, unless it's like a real emergency where you have to go to the hospital. In that case, you'll get it given to you by the emergency doctors. But uh, that's always worked for us. We can just get a prescription, and uh, once you... Once you're there talking to the doctor, I'll just say, if I lost my whole supply, I'll just say I need a six month or eight month supply and then they'll give it. You just have to pay for it. And the way we've got it sometimes is I can get two insulin vials at a time when I go to check in, but the prescription itself stays good until all the orders are filled. So if I get like, I need 12 vials, but I do two at a time, um, then just every time I go in, I get two. And that's that's been great. With most of the companies, medical companies that supply things like after a failure, if it's a a failure of a pump or something just not due to damage from you, you can normally send it in and get a replacement. Um, I've only done that once and it was when we were in Montana, a steady location for a couple of months and it's worth doing in that case or if you can have it shipped to a destination, you, like a hard point you know you're going to be in a couple of weeks, you can just call them and you know go through the normal process of getting a, a new CGM or pump returned to you. We just need to have a hard point. Uh, there's been plenty of times, like when we were traveling from Australia to Indonesia, I uh, left my whole entire insulin supply in Australia and we were on the plane to in Indonesia before I noticed. So I had to deal with it while we got there. And while they didn't seem to have any walk-in clinics there, I just went to the hospital and then showed them the small amount that I had and like what I need. And they didn't have the exact brand, but it was something similar um, to what I needed. And then I could just buy it on the spot. So you also just have to be willing to pay whatever it costs because like here in Canada it's very cheap in the states I know you can get it pretty readily just more expensive and I'm not sure about Europe but uh, in you know more uh, you know in play countries you're unfamiliar with often your best bet might just be going into a hospital waiting the time you have to and then getting the supply you need if you end up leaving something and uh, I think one of the most important things besides managing your type 1, because that'll save your insulin and keep your blood low, would be having the backup supply of some kind, a backup uh, type of management system. Because like I've mentioned, I keep syringes on hand and then I have finger prick testing, like the old fashioned way of testing, always in a med bag of some kind with us traveling. Because like uh, I have an example in our first time to Baja, camped right beside this beautiful beach. The tide was out further than we expected. Me and Dan set up a uh, ground tent right at the shoreline and we didn't really think through that if the tide's further out it'll come further in and we woke up at like 2 or 3 a.m. with a foot or two of water inside our tent and my med supplies were sitting there floating in ocean water. So my PDM, uh, my, my CGM stuff got wrecked and even my backup finger prick testing stuff got wrecked. So. The good thing is, is I had double backup just over the years. We built up quite a bit, so I had some stuff in the Jeeps and it was able to uh, be used. Because like losing something to measure your blood levels isn't the end of the world. You kind of know when you're low or high, but having those backups and you don't have to worry about it regardless. And we could just get back stateside and then uh, get all the supplies we needed. So I think that kind of answers everything. And in the meantime, we'll see you down the road. I'll keep running till I can yeah. You'll always be the one I want a midnight You'll always steal my breath away yeah. You'll always be my